Letters and Lectures of Idris Shah Compiled and edited by Adam Musa Original material, copyright 1981, by Adam Musa The content of the quotations herein are copyright 1981 by Idris Shah. This recording was produced and published in 1998 by arrangement with Adam Musa and the estate of Idris Shah. This book is read by David Wade. The Fox and the Birds There was once a fox who decided to give up his usual method of hunting. In fact, not realising that he could not change his inwardness by a change of outwardness, he really thought that by telling other creatures what to do, he would earn merit for himself, and would abstain from doing them harm. He was, in a word, in his own mind, a reformed character. His lectures to all and sundry and his apparently saintly way of life attracted many to him, especially birds. But as everyone knows, birds tend to go by appearances and to feel ashamed when challenged with their shortcomings. The crow first applied to the fox for instruction, and the fox took him to his mountain retreat. Next came the cock, and finally the owl. The fox interviewed the birds one by one. To the crow he said, You live on dead bodies, and although you think you can repent, nothing but death is good enough for you. And he seized the crow and killed and ate him. After a day, the fox sent for the cock. Do you repent your fighting proclivities, your lasciviousness and your pride? he asked. Yes, indeed. I abandon all these forms of behaviour, and now I want to learn the way to improve myself, so that I may enter upon the path of the elect. I will give you a suitable punishment, said the fox. He grabbed the cock to beat him, but as soon as the taste of feathers reached his mouth, he was unable to prevent himself killing the bird. Oh, well, said the fox, everyone knows that cocks are incorrigible. Finally, it was the turn of the owl. Owl, said the fox, I know you want to improve yourself. But although you may think that you have repented, you must demonstrate it. Now listen, while I speak of mice and sparrows, and I will watch you. The fox began to talk about delicious mice and sparrows, and he saw that the owl was licking his lips, in spite of his good resolutions. And, at the same time as he registered that the owl had not been able to detach from his habits, the fox himself felt the saliva running from his own mouth. Before he knew what he was doing, he sank his teeth into the owl's neck. As he did so, it seemed to him that he was performing a good deed. And he said to himself, I shall undoubtedly earn eternal merit by ridding the world of this unprincipled killer. The opinion of a fox about himself or others is just as valuable and as useless as any other opinion when there has been no real change in either or both. Abundance There was once a conceited and ignorant aristocrat he had convinced himself that everything which was in any way connected with him was of a special nature, which could function or yield its greatest value only because of his association with it. Among his possessions were a number of excellent fruit-bearing bushes, some plants which bore beautiful flowers, and a number of exceptional hens which laid abundantly. The citizens of the town adjacent to this odious man's estate tried everything they could to make him more humane. For decades, men of spirituality tried to reason with him, 
Philosophers tried to argue with him. Scholars tried to convince him that they were more learned than he. Nobody ever succeeded in making any impression on the man. One day, one of the townspeople decided to visit a wise man, a Sufi, who lived in the nearby hills. The remedy is quite simple, said the Sufi, and the only reason you have not thought of it is that your resentment of the man was stronger than your desire to learn how to overthrow him from his own behavior. Now, this is what you must do. He sent the man away to make a collection amongst the other people of the town. When they had amassed a certain sum of money, they went to the aristocrat and bought from him three of his bushes, six of his plants, and twelve of his hens. These things they installed in a garden near the town, in a place where the conceited man was sure to pass. Some months later, when the aristocrat was riding past, he looked and saw that the flowers were blooming, the bushes were laden with fruit, and the hens were laying plentifully. The realization that such things could also serve the common people and were not withering or ruined in such profane hands, so demoralized the arrogant man that he had a seizure, fell off his horse, and died. Obligation A poor man was unable to get a hearing from the lazy and self-seeking mayor of his town. He knew that the mayor, above all, wanted the goodwill of the governor of the province, and would do anything for him. Driven to the utmost distress, the poor man wrote a letter to the mayor. The letter said, I need your help, and I am sure that you will give it when you know that the governor himself is under a great obligation to me and will undoubtedly approve. The mayor was not sure whether the claim to rights over the governor was true or not. He gave a small allowance to the petitioner and wrote to the governor to inquire whether this man was indeed entitled to special treatment. The answer came. I am under an obligation to him, so treat him accordingly. So the petty official treated the poor man with respect and consideration, satisfying all his needs. When he was visiting the capital and called upon the governor to pay his respects, he said, I have treated such and such a poor man with all honour, as commanded by your excellency, and I am curious to know why you are under such an obligation, so that I may act in such a way as to acquire similar merit in your eyes. The governor replied, I had never heard of this man in my life before you wrote to me about him. But my obligation towards him is because he is a human being. The Three Priests and the Truth There were once two priests who decided to take an oath to preach religion, to tell only the truth, and to induce at least one more man to embrace their faith who would himself become a priest. They set out from their hometown on the assumption that people fare better far from their place of origin. Before very long they came upon a very old man and started to preach to him. He was captivated by what they had to say, and the two explained to him their mission. The Ancient One begged his new friends to have him ordained, so that he could take part in their undertaking. The priest agreed, and accompanied the Dodderer to their bishop, who received the man into holy orders. Then the three priests went on their way. After some time they came to the outskirts of a city, and found a stray camel, loaded with precious things, munching some cactus. The two younger priests, after wrestling with their consciences, decided that the camel had been sent to them from heaven, and so they took it 
and sold it in the next town, burying the jewels and costly stuffs which were its burden in a dried-up well. The priests now journeyed to another city, where they sat in a row, as was the habit in that country, proclaiming their teachings at the tops of their voices so that anyone might come forward to be saved. Some days later, the owner of the camel and its load came upon the devout ones, and in his search decided to ask them if they knew anything of his lost cargo. "'Reverend Master,' he said to the first priest, "'I have lost a camel with a valuable cargo on its back. Have you any idea where it might have strayed?' The priest remembered that he had taken an oath only to tell the truth. For a moment he hesitated, and then he said, "'Listen to me and be saved. Forget vain indulgences. Think only pure thoughts. Perform only correct actions. Speak kindly and wisely.' The merchant thought, "'This is just a religious fanatic. He wouldn't know anything about my camel.' And he started to walk further along the road. After a few steps, of course, he came upon the second priest, who was reciting prayers. He stopped by him and asked, "'Holy sir, I own a camel which has strayed. It has valuable things on its back. Have you by any chance seen it?' The second priest, who had told no lies since making his vow, decided that he would not change now. He said, "'Trade is ignoble. Repentance is sublime. Prayer is essential.' Sadly, the merchant passed on. Soon he came to where the third priest, the ancient, new-made one, was sitting. He repeated his question to him. The old fellow, too, remembered his oath. "'Yes,' he said, "'I have indeed seen your camel with its precious burden.' "'Where did you see it, and what happened?' asked the excited merchant. "'I saw it being taken by these two priests beside me.' The merchant thought, "'Those religious maniacs would not be able to think of anything except their litanies.' But, to make sure, he went on, "'When did you see it?' "'On the day after I was ordained into the priesthood,' mumbled the ancient." That must have been at least fifty years ago, by the look of him, thought the merchant. They are all mad in this town. And he went on his way. Now, those priests and their resolves represent parts of your own mind. You decide to do something and yet violate your resolves without being really aware of it. You can speak the truth literally and yet it can have the effect of lies or of uselessness, because there are too many selves within you. Ready to Learn A Sufi once arrived in a town whose citizens clamoured for him to teach them his wisdom. He had, however, already assessed their state and condition, and so he had to tell them, something else must happen first. Very well, said the people, just stay here among us, and we will wait until all is correctly aligned. That, said the wise man, was exactly what I intended to do. After quite a long time, news came that a celebrated performer was to pass that way. He is the world's greatest mimic, the people explained, and you have no idea how wonderfully he performs. He only visits us about three times in a decade. Everyone will be there to watch. And so they were. In the marketplace, the entire populace applauded one clever impersonation after another. The mimic copied the behavior of insects, animals, fish, people from modern and ancient times, even characters from fiction. As the Sufi watched, his neighbours in the crowd said, Now comes the grand finale. The mime artist always rounds off his show with the most remarkable imitation of a rooster that you can possibly imagine. Sure enough, the mimic immediately leapt up and down, shook his arms, 
and crowed so convincingly that people swore to one another that if they closed their eyes, they were sure that they were in the presence of a genuine barnyard cock. There were even those who did not close their eyes and still almost believed it. Then the Sufi stood up and climbed onto the fountain in the marketplace. Just one more demonstration, he said. Before anyone realised that he was doing it, he was jumping up and down, flapping his elbows and cocking his head to one side, while a discordant crowing accompanied the gestures. At first, the people were nonplussed, and then annoyance seized them. Why don't you stick to being a wise man, they shouted. Your imitation isn't half as good. At this, the Sufi lifted the cowl which hung behind his head and showed the people the source of the noise. A real, live cockerel. Why is the imitation sometimes preferred to the real? Throwing away and ignoring knowledge. Euclid, who lived about 300 BC, produced a proof in geometry that the two angles at the base of an isosceles triangle were equal to one another, which became the standard proof. There is another demonstration, however, which is more elegant, and this was made known by Pappus about 600 years later. The new proof was more elegant, but it did not only not catch on, it was soon forgotten. Time passed, and there is no record that anyone discovered this proof. In other words, the knowledge was lost until 1960, for 1,600 years. And even then, the proof was not discovered by a human, but by a computer. Can you imagine how many people studied geometry, some of them really brilliant people, some of those innovators, between the years 300 and 1960. We live in a world where, without examining it, we assume that everything that was known in the past is still known today, where we think of knowledge as an accumulative process, as scientists believe it to be, where each part will help each other part, until, I suppose, at some time, all knowledge will come together and we will know everything. This can happen, however, only if we register the knowledge and then use it. In order to do that, we need to make a deliberate effort. And those who fail must be helped by those who succeed. This process must be an orderly and understood one, or we will continue to tread the path not of knowledge, but of the kind which is exemplified by the true story of Euclid, Pappus, and the computer. For there are many other instances of this kind. To help us understand this problem, and also to help fix in our minds the reasons why people ignore knowledge, there is a really useful and also interesting story. The Effects of Greed and Heedlessness there was once a young man who became eager to receive instruction from a wise man in the Sufi way. He expected harangues and trials of his wits and all kinds of things which he associated with spiritual learning. What he got when he eventually arrived at the sage's door was long periods of indifference and having to fetch and carry for his teacher with very little in the way of entertainment or even mystification. One day his mentor handed him an axe and said, Go into the woods and chop some wood for the fire. The youth set off and found a likely-looking tree. Swinging the axe, he missed the wood, and the metal struck against a small rock embedded in the ground. The young man picked up the implement and saw that the blade was twisted. He returned to the philosopher's house and complained that he had been given an axe which had not been properly tempered. The teacher showed signs of annoyance and dismissed the disciple, who wandered off, muttering against the older man and congratulating himself that he had at last managed to see the true nature of someone who, it now seemed clear, 
was no master of the path at all. He had been warned by the teacher that he should observe his own impatience, malobservation, jumping to conclusions. But he had allowed all these factors to operate when he failed to note that the axe had been perfect when he was handed it, that the blade had become warped when it hit the rock, and that afterward it had turned to pure gold. The rock, you see, was nothing less than the philosopher's stone, which turns base metal into gold at a touch. When the youth had departed, the sage followed his trail to the woods, where he unearthed the rock and took it back to his house. Each time a disciple presented himself after that, the master would have him chop wood on the rock, though for a very long time none of them ever noted that choppers became gold. They were annoyed that the wood did not chop. Then, one day, one young man actually did notice what had happened, and the wise man presented the stone to him, and the disciple used it to set himself up as the richest man in his own land. Eventually, he began to think that he should marry the daughter of his king, and sent him vast quantities of gold as a sign of fealty and a hint of his intentions. The king reckoned that this would make a suitable son-in-law. After all, he said to himself, if I don't give this youth my daughter, he will most likely in the end displace me, for he seems to have more wealth than I have ever dreamt of. The princess, for better or worse, thought that it would be a good idea to marry the young millionaire, and so the wedding plans were laid. Now, all this happened in the East, where it is the custom for the bridegroom to provide the dowry, which is the amount of wealth which is given by him to his wife and which remains her property, to ensure her some financial freedom. Everyone was agog when the beautifully decorated chest containing the dowry was placed before the king, who had invited all the divines and grandees, the ambassadors and military commanders, the principal merchants and great landowners, and many others in his realm, to witness the worthiness of his intended son-in-law. When the chest was opened, however, all that was visible was a dirty-looking rock. The king looked at the interpreter of auguries for an explanation. Majesty, he whispered, this stone is a symbol of the contempt which the young man feels for you and your daughter. As this rock is worthless, so does he tell you he thinks you are. Now the king commanded the admiral of his fleets to take the chest with the rock in it and sail to the centre of the deepest ocean and to throw it overboard. As I have sent this insult to the deepest place on earth, I shall hang this youth from a gallows on the highest mountain, he swore. Not long afterwards, the suitor himself arrived at court with a dazzling display of finery, mounted on the finest Arabian steed that money could buy, and escorted by a glittering band of knights. He was led into the presence of the monarch. Before the king had had time to speak, he inquired, I trust that your majesty received the philosopher's stone, the most precious gift which man can obtain, and which I have presented to the princess in token of my estimation of her. At this, pandemonium broke out. The king sent his swiftest messengers to intercept the admiral, and he and the youth wept inconsolably when the report came back that the stone had indeed already been consigned to the greatest depth of the ocean. And it is said that although the princess ran off and married the man of her choice, the king and the youth spent the rest of their days wandering by the seashore and crying out, The stone! The stone! while the nation collapsed and was conquered by a relentless enemy. It was many more years 
before anyone else managed to find and to understand another stone of the philosophers. Now, the individuals featuring in this tale are all paralleled by activities in the human mind. Whether they be the disciples, the king, the princess, the interpreter of auguries, or even the admiral. The stone of the philosophers takes many forms. The saving grace is that the stone is indeed found again and again, and the sage does indeed exist. The role of the sage includes not only presenting knowledge and helping in its perception, it also involves distinguishing between real and irrelevant or distorted knowledge. Here is an example. Supposedly and acceptedly authoritative reference books insist that the cynic Diogenes lived in a tub. If you look up the much-hailed Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, you will find the words, Diogenes, according to Seneca, lived in a tub. But the Stoic Seneca, writing three centuries after Diogenes, said no such thing. He said that Diogenes was so crabbed that he ought to have lived in a tub like a dog. Knowledge to the Sufi is that knowledge which can be confirmed by personal experience, not statements which are believed to be true. The Men and the Butterfly Once upon a time, on a hot summer's day, two tired men who were on a very long journey came to a riverside where they stopped to rest. Moments later, the younger man had fallen asleep, and, as the other watched, his mouth fell open. Can you believe it when I tell you that a little creature to all appearances a beautiful miniature butterfly, then flew out from between his lips. The insect swooped onto a small island in the river, where it alighted upon a flower and sucked nectar from its cup. Then it flew around the tiny domain, which must have seemed huge to an insect of that size a number of times, as though enjoying the sunshine and the soft breeze. Soon, it found another of its own kind, and the two danced in the air as if flirting one with the other. The first butterfly settled again on a gently swaying twig, and after a moment or two it joined a mass of large and small insects of several kinds which swarmed around the carcass of an animal lying in the lush green grass. Several minutes passed. Idly, the wakeful traveller threw a small stone into the water near the little island, and the waves which this created splashed the butterfly. At first it was almost knocked over, but then, with difficulty, it shook the droplets from its wings and rose into the air. It flew, with wings beating at top speed, back towards the sleeper's mouth. But the other man now picked up a large leaf and held it in front of his companion's face to see what the little creature would do. The butterfly dashed itself against this obstruction again and again, as if in panic, while the sleeping man started to writhe and groan. The butterfly's tormentor dropped the leaf, and the creature darted quick as a flash into the open mouth. No sooner was it inside than the sleeper shuddered and sat up, wide awake. He told his friend, I have just had a most unpleasant experience, a dreadful nightmare. I dreamt that I was living in a pleasant and secure castle, but became restless and decided to explore the outside world. In my dream I travelled by some magical means to a far country, where all was joy and pleasure. I drank deep, for instance, from a cup of ambrosia, 
as much as I wanted. I met and danced with a woman of matchless beauty, and I disported myself in endless summer. I played and feasted with many good companions, people of all kinds and conditions, natures, ages, and complexions. There were some sorrows, but these only served to emphasize the pleasures of this existence. This life went on for many years. Suddenly, and without warning, there was a catastrophe. Huge tidal waves swept over the land. I was drenched, and I very nearly drowned. I found myself hurtling back towards my castle as if on wings, but when I reached the entrance gate, I could not get in. A huge green door had been put up by a giant evil spirit. I threw myself against it, pushing it again and again, but it did not yield. Suddenly, as I felt that I was about to die, I remembered a magic word which was reputed to dissolve enchantments. No sooner had I spoken it than the great green portal fell away like a leaf in the wind, and I was able to enter my home again and to live thenceforth in safety. But I was so frightened that I woke up. Now it is said that you, as you may have guessed, are the butterfly. The island is this world. The things which you like and dislike are therefore seldom what you think they are. Even when your time arrives to go, or when you think about it, you only find distortions of the facts, which is why this question cannot ordinarily be understood. But beyond the butterfly is the sleeping man. Behind both of these is the true reality. Given the right opportunity, the butterfly can learn about these things about where it really comes from, about the nature of the sleeping man, and about what lies beyond these two.